I'm going to be reading from verse 54 through verse 71 as we continue along the road to Calvary. And as Easter approaches and Good Friday, we draw closer and closer to the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. With all the sorrow and all the suffering that meant for him and for our salvation. Now let's read and hear what is going to take place with Peter and then the Lord Jesus. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. But a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with them. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. Peter said, Man, I did not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, and how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, today you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him, and they also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy! Who is it to And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. And when day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council, and they said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe, and if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. And then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own way. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, how we thank you for all that you went through for our salvation. And now may our hearts meditate on what you went through and how you were stronger in your time of temptation and struggle than we ever could be. And help us to realize the reason that we are here today is because of your son, not ours. Hear our prayer. Amen. What are some of the failures in life that are well known? Think of sports, for instance. An athlete will spend countless hours training for a particular task on the playing field. One athlete, Jose Canseco, outfielder for many years for the Oakland A's. He's out in the outfield, batter hits a pop-up. What happens? It hits Jose Canseco on the head. Another example, NCAA basketball tournament. A player goes in for a dunk, what does he do? Goes off the backboard. He does not score. Or recently, one of the most well-known incidents was quarterback Mark Sanchez of the New York Jets. He was running a play, and what did he run into? The hind quarters of his own offensive line. Not him down. Very embarrassing for people who have trained and have developed skills. And it's not only sports, it can be politics too. Think of Jimmy Carter, 
whose translator messed up his speech, and he said in front of a Polish audience, I lust for the Polish people. John Edwards, North Carolina senator who ran for the presidency of the United States, was later caught in an adulterous affair while his wife was sick with cancer. It was embarrassing for him, and rightly so. And even in the Bible, those who seem to be the pillars of the church make some tremendous gaps and mistakes which brought to shame. Think of Abraham, for instance. He said to a foreign ruler that Sarah was his sister, not a wife. Why? Because he was scared of getting killed. Think of David. You read about that this morning. A man after God's own heart. What does he do? He goes out and commits adultery with Bathsheba and then kills somebody. And on the road to Calvary, what do we find first up? Peter's faith. That supposed mighty man of God wimps out when light started to squeeze. So the question is this morning, what happens when we fail? What happens? What happens to those who seem to be so strong in the faith, yet under pressure from the world, they went out? Well, what you have is really a failure of faith. And if there is anyone in the Bible who failed at faith, it is Peter. Nay, the rock becomes pebbles. Now, there are many people in the world who think that they are strong, that they're faithful to the Lord. And if you look at your life and their track record, you may say the same thing. They are attached to the church. They attend every worship service. Morning and evening, Wednesday night, they show up for the meetings. They participate in the life of the church far above all other people. They may even become an elder or a deacon in the church. They are the big givers, the select of the elect, the marines of missions, the seals of salvation, the rangers of redemption. Great track. And internally in their own lives, they may say, look at what I've done. I used to be a chief in my business, but now I've cleaned up my shady business practices. I no longer cuss like a sailor. I feel strong in the faith. I am sure that Peter felt the exact same way. And certainly, Peter had a lot of strengths. I mean, look at what he's done. He stood up for the Lord. While they were having the last supper together, he appears to be a salty marine type. And Jesus tells him, Satan seeks to sift you like wheat. But Peter says, no, Lord. If you go to the cross, I will go with you because I am strong. And at the garden of Gethsemane, he pulls out the sword and strikes at the servant of the high priest. He's a man of action. You would think a man of faith. But now, after Jesus has been taken away by the soldiers and Judas, in the dead of night, the disciples start to disappear in the darkness. And we know that Peter is following at a distance, still in the shadows. And Jesus is taken to the high priest's house, and Peter follows along in the dark, just behind the rest of the crowd. And look at what happens in verse 56. Then a servant girl, not a soldier, 
not another man, a servant girl seeing him as he sat in the light, probably around the campfire, and looking closely at him said, this man also was with him, but he denied it. Oh no, not me, woman. In verse 58, someone else saw him. You're one of them. Peter said, man, I am not. A third time, Peter denies the Lord, saying, man, I don't know you. Three times, three denials. Peter, the rock, becomes sane. And what does it say about his guilt? The rooster crows. And I want you to notice something here in verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord before the rooster crows today, he will deny me three times. And Peter breaks down and starts to weep. Maybe in our remembrance of the story, we've forgotten that. The Lord looks directly at Peter. And it all comes back to him. And Peter is a quiver. He whips out. Can you imagine the shame that he is experiencing at this point? Now let's just say, for instance, a young boy goes out for football. And it is August, and the weather is hot, and he is not used to the drills, the conditioning, the hitting. And after a while, getting hit one too many times, he decides he does not want to play anymore. But the equipment has to be returned to the field house. He can't do it because of the shed. He's went down. And what is it the boys are not supposed to do? You don't win out in football. So an uncle has to go take the football equipment back because he can't do it himself. Now you are beginning to understand what Peter was going through because he quit. He quit on the Lord Jesus Christ. And of all the sins that we can think of in the Bible, to me, this is one of the most grievous sins of all. To whip out while the Lord Jesus Christ is looking at you in the face after you've made so many boasts. This is not what the Lord wanted. Think of other scripture stories. Daniel goes to the lion's den because of his belief he will not back down. Three friends of Daniel are thrown into the fiery furnace. But they won't back down. And Jesus says this in Matthew 10. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown before my Father in heaven. What a warning. You disown me, I'll disown you. J.C. Ryle, the English commentator, put it this way. A confessing master must have uncompromising and confessing disciples. And when we look at a lot of Christians in the world today, they simply wimp out, despite the warnings, and they quit. Here's some examples from the world of youth. A fellow classmate stands up proclaiming the truth of Christianity. But the other Christian friend doesn't even stand with them. He sneaks away. Think of someone who wants to read their Bible before school, but they're scared to bring the Bible because of what people will say. We call it peer pressure. But it's, it's not only for those who are young. You can be older and still face those same social situations. Where someone says, well, Mormons will go to heaven. And yet you know it's wrong. 
you know that's not in the Bible, yet nothing is said. The failure to participate in evangelism, why? Because of the pressure, and people may reject you, you went back. When I was in Mississippi, there was what was known as the life chain. It was where members of the evangelical and conservative churches were going to get together to hold hands and pray by the roadside for the unborn. In other words, they were protesting abortion. Of all the PCA churches in southern Mississippi, none of them showed up. Why? It was considered to be too radical. The only people from the Presbyterian Church that showed up was my Jan and myself. Because it was too radical. No, it wasn't too radical. I think the real problem was shame. Shame of having to stand up for those beliefs we hold dear. And you may think, well, that's not bad. But you look into the eyes of Jesus, and you tell me what he thinks. What would he say? We may have the talk, but do we have the walk? We may say we're courageous, but do we quit? That's the story of Peter. And believe me, if this story ended right there, oh, we would have so many problems. But as Paul Harvey said, let's hear the rest of the story. Because while Peter is so much like us, in fact, in this whole passage, he's the one I identify with. There is another person. It's Jesus. And look at what is happening here. While Peter denies the faith, Jesus is on trial. He doesn't face persecution. That is Peter. Jesus is. But Jesus is standing firm. Look at, what, look at what's happening to our Savior in verse 65. It says in verse 65, they said many other things, blasphemy. They were saying dirty, nasty things about Jesus. Before that, in 64, they were playing blind man's bluff. He was blindfolded. They kept asking him, prophesy. And then someone would strike him. In other words, they were hitting him probably in his face. Who wants to go through that? But our Lord does. Does he deny who he is? He could have said, look, you guys have got it all wrong. No, this is wrong. I, you misunderstood. I never said I was the Christ. And he could have probably gotten out. He doesn't do that. Instead, he is like a lamb that is led to slaughter because he doesn't want to fall away from his mission or from his God. And look at what happens next. He is taken from the high priest's courtyard, and then he goes to the Sanhedrin. And look at what is happening here in 67 through 69. They ask him, if you're the Christ, tell us. Does he deny that he is the Christ? No. He does say, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. The image is taken from the book of Daniel. And what Jesus is saying is this. You think you're judging me? No, 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 no. I'm going to be judging you at the right hand of God. And then in verse 70, they say, Are you the Son of God then? And he said, You say that I am. And we may think, well, he's trying to get out of, of the accusation. No. It, what is happening here is that he is giving an indirect affirmation of who he is. In other words, it's saying it like this in the modern you said it. Jesus doesn't deny he's the Christ. Jesus doesn't deny him. <clears throat> and you know why this event is important to us? Let me tell you. It's in 2 Timothy. And 
here's what it says about us and about Jesus. If we deny him, he will also deny us. But then notice the next part. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Except for Father, Jesus is always faithful. And ultimately, in our salvation, we will win God. We will fail Jesus. But Jesus never fails us. And the reason you're saved is because of Jesus. It's not because you've been faithful all the time. It's because he was the one who put up with all the abuse and the persecution in the earth. And your faith is ultimately based on his forgiveness. You know, this incident with Peter doesn't end here. Because there's another incident with Jesus and Peter. And it's after the resurrection. And it's in John chapter 21. And here's what happens. Jesus has risen from the dead. And what are the, the disciples doing? They've gone back to the old trade. They're out fishing. And Jesus is on the shore. And there's a fire. And the men aren't able to catch any fish. So he says, throw the net on the other side. And they do it. And they bring in a great haul of fish. And Peter knows it's the Lord. And he gets into the water. He comes to Jesus. And listen to what Jesus says to him three times. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? In a bit of catharsis, and I would suspect emotion, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Tend my sheep. And he said to them the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved. Because he said it a third time, do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Three times Peter denied him. Three times the Lord confronts him. And finally, Peter has repented what he did, and his sins are covered. And later, Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you want, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. In other words, Peter may have went out, but the Lord was going to use Peter, and one day, Peter would go to his death. God had not given up on Peter. Yes, it did take repentance. It did take turning to Jesus. But that's why we always look to Jesus. It's not up to us. One of the big events in college football is the story of Roy Riggles. He is known as Wrong Way Riggles. He played for the University of California, Los Angeles. And it was the Rose Bowl where they were playing Georgia Tech. Riggles was the center. He got the ball, but he ran in the wrong direction. Almost scored for the opposite team, his opponents, Georgia Tech. But he was stopped short. He came out of the game and he told his coach, I can't do this anymore. And the coach said, Roy, get up and go back out there. The game is only halfway over. And I think that's the way Jesus deals with us. Because the game isn't over with you. And for those who come to a sense of their betrayal of the Lord Jesus and turn to Him, there is still time. And God can still use you. Even though we betray Him. So what is Easter about? Easter is about the debris of failed saints on the road to Calvary. 
Yet, in the middle of that road is the faithful Lord Jesus. And I think as we move closer and closer to Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, Jesus says to us, don't look at yourself. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me and what I went through for you. Let's go. Oh, Lord God, how we need Jesus. Because we're a lot more like Peter and a lot less like you. And our faith tells us that we are to look to you, not ourselves. Because we have faith. But because by faith we are connected to you, we have been made victors through Jesus. And that is who we look to this time of year. I make this prayer to his.